Well, good morning. Hey, my name is Ron Dozier. I'm the campus pastor here. Delighted to be with you and absolutely delighted to be able to spend these three weeks uh, with you. So I want to thank you, say thank you to our pastor Talbot for providing this uh, opper, opportunity. And uh, we're going to wrap up this series. It's called What's in a Name? Uh, with this, I'll take a look at uh, a name that's going to be lifted out of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 6. And before you, you turn there, something I want to let you know. We say it every single week that is, is library, not book, but unlike any other library in all the world, it's inspired, it's eternal, and it's true. So we do something that some people think is kind of odd. We lift it up. That's our way of saying, and catch this, not just when we're in here, but picture this Bible going with us when we leave, <laughs> leave the sanctuary and follow us home. We're living under the authority of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And thank you so much. I see people in the prayer team, so many people that have uh, prayed with me and for me in this process. Thank you so much. Thank you for your commitment to the Lord and to prayer. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, and thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I do pray now that even as the song says, that you'll continue to pour out your spirit into our hearts and minds. Lord, allow me to decrease, and we pray that you would increase. Lord, do what only you can do, even beyond my words. It's about your work. So I pray as we examine the text. May you present yourself, and may you speak to the hearts of your people. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you'll do. For us in Jesus' name, we pray. Let all who agree say together, amen. Amen. There's something interesting about our youngest son, Zachary, who's 16. I know it's not unique to me. I found this out by talking to other parents. But what's so interesting is, is they kind of reach that age of stage where when we go out in public, he, he acts like he doesn't know me. Anybody else going through that same thing? Yeah, with your kids? Yeah, you, don't, you, sorry, been there, done that. We, we go out there. See, he worked, he was working, got a new job now. Boy, that boy works hard. He was working at Harris Teeter, so I was dropping him off at work and got there to Harris Teeter and told him, hey, Zach, I'm just going to go inside. I got a couple things to pick up. Pick up a few things. And he was like, no, no, no. Go to another Harris Teeter. <laughs> Th this is my Harris Teeter. That's part of that jingle. My Harris Teeter. I, maybe that he got overwhelmed with that. Like he owned the place. <laughs> which, which makes what I'm about to share with you so puzzling to me. You see, Zachary had a, there he is, he had, a, he had an ingrown toenail. <laughs> and I took him to the foot doctor, the podiatrist, and we went inside, went back, I'm getting ready to see her. I said, Zach, I'm going to wait out here. Oh, oh, before I go, don't worry about it. They got this real long needle. And just to make sure that you don't feel any pain, they're going to stick that long needle in your toe. Don't worry about its length because it just, it's going to make sure it goes right up your foot. It's not going to protrude out or anything like <laughs> Every word I say, his eyes got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then something puzzling happened. The one that act like he doesn't know me all of a sudden knew me. He grabbed my arm. Dad, where you going? You stay right here. <laughs> and he held on for dear life. He just said, hey, don't go anywhere. When the situation brought on stress, he remembered that he could call on his dad. And I didn't forget about my commitment to him. So many times when facing troubling circumstances, it's easy to forget something significant that we really need to remember. That's why I want to introduce you to one of the names of God that was first introduced to us in the book of Judges by Gideon. And let me tell you, this name for God has literally transformed my own life. It's something I want to tell you about the book before we get started because Judges is a cyclical book. We see a pattern that's often repeated You'll see like 12 different stories. It starts off, people fall into sin and idolatry. It upsets God. He, then he removes that protection. They get oppressed by their enemies. People cry out to God. 
He sends them deliverance through a judge that he will raise up. It's not like the traditional judge that you're thinking about in our modern times, but he sends a judge that he raises up. Then they experience a period of peace, followed by the judge dies. Then they're right back to turning away from God, sinning, and going after other gods. That's a constant theme in the book of Judges. Another one is this. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And that's exactly why we'll pick up reading in Judges chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. So with that in mind, let's read this. It says, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live in, but you have not listened to me. God has reminded them of his constant activity in their life. He had to make them reflect back on the past so they could see his commitment to them that didn't end when they were in these present circumstances. See, he passes down these stories in the present so that I might remember his commitment to them in the past. Now the Midianites, a once defeated foe, had reemerged from the east and they were plundering Israel's land with an overwhelming mob-like force. This would explain Gideon's unusual behavior when we're introduced to him in verse 11. Let's see what Gideon was doing in verse 11. It says this, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Gideon was threshing wheat, but he was doing it not in the open, but he was hiding, doing it in the wine press. Very very unusual activity, but he did it out of fear. You see, the writer is beginning to paint a picture, kind of a profile of Gideon. Courage didn't seem to be Gideon's strong suit, would you say? Mm Mm-mm. Only look at how the angel addressed Gideon when he spoke to him. Verse 12, it says this, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now get this. He's hiding. He's acting cowardly. And here's the angel that says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. His behavior didn't suggest being a mighty warrior, did it? It wouldn't suggest that. Have you ever had somebody that saw something in you before you did? Maybe a parent, a teacher, a spouse, or a friend, a mentor. They saw a talent, skill, or ability. You know, my grandmother did that for me. Ever since I was about eight years, there she is right there. We called her Nanina. Yes, that's, that's the Nina. That's my Nanina. She would tell me three things. This is even before I came to a relationship with Jesus. She would always say to me, especially when I'm great, go out and probably doing some things I shouldn't do. She stopped me. I love you. I'm praying for you. And God is going to use you mightily in his kingdom one day. And do you know at 56 years old, I guess that's how old I am, (laughs) her words still reverberate in my mind. She's gone to heaven, but her words, that's how powerful our words can be when we settle them down, speaking positivity into your spouse or your children's lives. I, I still carry that with me because it reminds me of God's activity. There's so many times along my faith journey when it came to mind that God is going to be doing something, and he is, something incredible in my life of which I am eternally grateful. See, this underscores this truth. 
that we are what God declares us to be. I want you to say that with me. I am what God declares me to be, not my circumstances. Now think about this. We got to live into that reality. You can know that and not do that. It's different than trying to live up to. No, live into. He's inviting you to be what he's called us to be. Then Gideon raises an interesting question, kind of some of the questions I raise to the Lord when I'm talking to him when he's asking me to do something, even particularly even sharing, sharing his truth. Take a look at verse 13. It says this. He says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of the Midianites. Isn't it interesting? Here's the irony. They had turned away from God and they accused God of abandoning them. You know, we, it, it's, it's like we develop this, this rhythm nation mentality. We go all Janet Jackson on God. You know what it's talking about? What have you done for me lately? You'd have to be from the 80s to get that, amen. <laughs> Yet the Lord, in the middle of that, he was raising up Gideon. They cried out he was raising them up. The moment we're thinking that God is abandoning, God is preparing. He's raising up. You might not be able to see it, but yet he's actively doing something in response to what we're going through. Take a look at verse 14. It says this. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Gideon, just, just go in the strength that you have. You mean with some of the doubts that I have? You mean with some of the insecurities that I have? You know, with some of the inadequacies that I'm aware of down on the inside? He said, yeah, go in the strength that you have, and you're going to see my strength. But the key is we got to... We got to respond. We have to, we have to go so that we can experience the power and the presence of what God wants to demonstrate. His awesome commitment for us. Listen, don't underestimate what God can do through you. Did you hear that? Don't underestimate what God can do through you. I just love his answer because it, it, it actually is a game changer. Take a look at verse 16. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none of them alive. You know what? That's called the great commitment. You know, you have the great commission. That's the great commitment. I will be with you, me, myself, Ego, I me. I will. I will. I'm not just sending you. I'm going to be with you. And what you're going through, whatever obstacle you're facing, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be lockstep in with you. He's committed to us. It's, it's that great commitment. It's God's commitment to be with us is where our confidence comes from. After Gideon got the confirmation from God that it was him, he hears his word from God. Take a look at verses 22 through 24. Let me read that to you. It says, when Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, the Lord is peace. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abizarites. Overwhelmed by the confirmation 
and commendation of the Lord, Gideon built an altar and he named it. And this has literally transformed my life. He says, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace or Jehovah Shalom, a tribute and reminder of the Lord's provision and his promise of peace. This brings me to what I wanted to share with you. It's great peace comes when we remember not our commitment to him, but God's commitment. Great peace comes when we, I am with you. When we remember his commitment to us. Gillian built an altar, memorialized the name of God, the Lord is peace. It would serve as a reminder which combats our restlessness. Anybody here get restless? And to tell the truth, shame the devil. Everybody here get, yes. Something happened this morning. You, you get you get rested. But what does he have for us? He has peace. Somebody say peace. peace. The Lord is peace. The peace that he's talking about, it's not just calm. It's way beyond that. It encompasses your well-being. He speaks peace because he cares about you as a whole person. He proclaims that I got you, past, present, future. That peace, it, it resonates in our heart, mind, body, and soul. It is, it is the peace of God, the peace of God. So let me encourage you to write down, are there ways that God has worked in your life in the past? Yes. Write it down. Get a journal. Reflect and record the goodness of God. We remember what we repeat, so say it. Say it over and over again what God is doing in your life. Share your testimonies with one another. In the middle of all the current events, we ought to be able to say, but God, look what God did here. Look what God did there. Every week we have a prayer list. We invite people to send in their prayer requests. We ask you to do it and you send them in. But on the sheet that we take in the room to pray, it's listed in two things. One is requests, but what precedes that is we rejoice because we write down all the ways that God is answering prayer. So before we get to the request, we want to thank God for what he's already done. Somebody else say amen. You ought to sit down with your family and weekly just sit down and just take a look at the week. Thank God for what he's done. Because it, we, people would tend to forget and not see God demonstrated his awesome power. Listen, if we only knew how God, he's committed to us. It was illustrated for me by my grandmother the commitment of my heavenly father. We were in Arlington, Texas, some 20 years ago. And my sister gets really, put on a scary movie, she'll get scared. And all types of stuff might happen. Well, we went there, saw a scary movie. I don't know why we did that. She spilled her drink all over herself. Then she decided to, that wasn't enough. Let's just get wet any way we can think of. You just use your imagination. Yes. So when it was time to leave, you know, being a good brother that I am, I said, let me go get the car. So I went out here and got the car. But let me tell you what my mother did, her cane and all. She pulled up beside my sister. She said, come here, baby. With her soil, she walked in lockstep with her about 200 yards all the way to the car, just walking with her, saying, I don't care what just happened to you in a sense that I'm, I'm with you. And I, as my little cowardly self, worrying about what people think, I'm sitting in the car, I wonder they, they here yet, anything like that, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. He said, son, if you are going to be doing ministry for me, you got to have a commitment like that. you got to be right there walking lockstep with people in their lives. And after crying, I went back out and walked on the other side with my mom. All of a sudden, don't even care. We got you, sis. That's just a thimble full of God's commitment to you, no matter what you're going through. And you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. You feel like things that you want to hide or whatever. Know this. 
God is so committed to you that he's going to walk with you. He's going to walk with you right through it. Somebody praise the Lord for his commitment. Hallelujah. He has a rich history that intersects with our story. You know, I had a problem with uh, struggling with some unforgiveness. There's some people that did some things to me that I really, like, intentionally lied on me. And, you know, uh, honestly, I, I hated them for it. I felt like it wasn't fair. And I was holding on to it. And to this day, some of them don't even acknowledge it, even though I brought it up. Never asked for forgiveness. But God said, give me that, son. Give me that. And I turned it over to him. And I forgave. And he did a work and a wonder in my heart to let you know you can exchange your hurt for the wholeness that God provides. Then he ushered my heart with peace, such a peace that I could let it go because the Lord is peace. That's who he is. That's what he provides. Isaiah 26, 13 says, we have this promise of peace. He'll keep thee in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts you. God is committed to discipling us in order that we may live holy lives. Let us live for him because guess what's the biggest disruptor of peace? It's sin. When we don't do what we're supposed to do, we cannot expect the peace of God. But oh, when we do, he will provide it and we definitely we need it. Amen? I love what Jesus said to his disciples when he appeared to them in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. Let me read it for us. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said what? Peace. Peace be to you. After he said that, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sends me, so I send you. What an encouragement. He speaks peace, and it changed their mentality and their situation. In a world where people are increasingly overwhelmed with stress, let us declare the peace of God. God has peace. He has peace. There was an art gallery that had a prize. They were going to give an artist a prize if they could paint the best picture of peace. Well, they had all these paintings, and all of them, like, they looked beautiful. They were serene and tranquil. You're looking at them, you might want to just lay out, and who almost make me want to go to the beach. Just as a lay out and, and peaceful. But that's not the one that won. The one that won was a painting of a thunderstorm with the waves crashing all around. But you look down in the corner, and there was a little tree. And there was a bird there in a nest sitting on top of the young. And, and the young were at peace. You see, peace is not just the absence of a storm but it's rest in the middle, in the middle of the storm. Somebody say, in the middle of the storm. The Lord is peace. Whatever you're going through now, the Lord is peace. Not pills, not position, not status. The Lord is peace, and that's exactly what he provides. Jehovah Shalom provides peace that surpasses all understanding. What Paul can say in Philippians chapter 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be apparent to all. You know how you can let it be apparent to all? Because no matter what's going on around you, let me tell you what's happening in you. It's the peace of God resonating in your life. I, I claim that peace. I use that peace because all of us experience storms, don't we? Yes, we do, but God has peace. Say it with me. The Lord is peace. Let that settle in your spirit. The Lord, he's peace. That's what he provides. He provides. 
so we don't have to be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, we can let our requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart. That's your emotions. And your mind, that's your thoughts. Guess what? Through Christ Jesus, he's so committed to us, he was willing to go to the cross to die for our sins, shed his blood, raise from the dead. Now he's at the right hand of the Father forever living to make intercession for us. Knowing that, I got peace. So whatever he asks us to do, we can live to it because of his great commitment. Great peace comes by remembering God's commitment. Don't, don't forget what God has done. Not so much what we're trying to do. Don't forget what God has done. He has a rich history of coming through for his people. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And if he's come through for you, you ought to just give him a wave offering this morning. Let him know, yes, Lord, I acknowledge you did that for me. And Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. May you live into the great peace that God provides by remembering his commitment. And the cross and the empty tomb demonstrates his commitment to us and sending his spirit to live inside of us so that we can live the way that he wants us to. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let's pray. God, thank you for the peace that you provide. And I do pray, even now, that you would pour it out into our lives, allow us to live in that gift of peace. Because, Lord, you are peace. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all who agree say together, amen and amen.